Bird, 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 bird! Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey, everybody. It's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast, and it is the 16th of January. You know what that means? In exactly one month, on the 16th of February, I will be arriving in Minneapolis to set up my booth for the Hunting Dog Podcast, along with Gumleaf Boots, Wilderness Athlete, Pike Gear will be across the aisle from us. I, 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 I'm as excited as the hunting season coming up. Um, and actually, that's what this episode is about. I got Jared Wickland, one of my Pheasant Forever buddies, who is uh, he's in charge of marketing and 15 other things there at Pheasants Forever. And we kind of run down the show. We run down... His last season, a little bit of my season, a couple funny stories. It, it, you know, it's always about dogs and stories. But we, we, we give a, a, a nice little overview of the show. So don't. If you've got a possibility to get to Pheasant Fest this year, please do. Not just to come up to our booth, but to see all the stuff. Now, if you're there, you get to play Cornhole for Conservation. We have made a cornhole game out of two Gunner Kennel food crates. Gunner. Gave me a couple extra lids so I didn't have to ruin my crates. I bored a hole in them, and we're going to have a cornhole game. Yeah, cheapskates can play for free and try to win a koozie or something, but real hunters will throw a dollar in the can, and all that money will go to, yeah, you know, habitat. That's right. Anyway, my Patreon patrons, last Zoom room was so much fun. I showed them a new thing I'm working on, a new project I'm working on. It's an audio-video program, or not program, project. And I showed, them, I showed them some little tidbits, like some segments of it, to get feedback. And I got everything. I think everybody liked it, but it gave me a lot of information. I'm going to do that again, the next Zoom room, with another project. It's, it's, all, it's all related. You know, um, it's just a it's, it's just something different than a podcast. It's something different than a hunting, training your dog uh, video. It's very cool, and it was so much fun. And I got to share it with who? My Patreon patrons. In fact, while I think of that, I'm going to send to my hunting dog podcast talk patrons, I'm going to send them, because they can't all attend this. I understand. People, people got lives. They got kids. They got soccer, basketball, work late, whatever. So we get a very small chunk of our patrons that get to come on these things. I will tomorrow, well, depending on when you're listening to this, doesn't matter. I'm going to send the My Hunting Dog Podcast talk patrons. I'm going to send them the video clips. And I would love their input. I would love their input. Yeah, exactly. That's how it, Patreon's a big part. No, Patreon's the biggest part of this podcast. Pike Gear, my title sponsor, is my second biggest part of the podcast. But... Not to be outdone by Onyx Maps, Boss Shot Shells, Waltons, Gunner Kennels, Garmin, W Hunting Supply, Deck Drawer Systems, Weatherby Shotguns, Purina Pro Plan, K9 Athlete. Good Lord. Could you imagine that? If I'd have just took that, I'm only at three minutes and I just went through my sponsors, but I do want to thank them all. And and I know most of you skip, but also most of you know all these sponsored by by memory because I do talk about them and you do listen to the intro. Nothing in fact over half of my sponsors are going to be at Pheasant Fest. So if you want to get deep into it, Weatherby's gonna have a booth there. Prina has the biggest display seminars, dog training. It's unbelievable. Um it, if the sponsors of mine that aren't going to have a booth there, their products will be at my booth. So come to my booth. And it's a nice big space. We're going to have a bar. You don't have to bring your own beer because I can't sell beer there. But we're going to have a bar. We're going to have bar stools. We're going to have cornhole for conservation. It's going to be so much fun. I can't wait to see you all. So there you go. That was quick. I don't think I've ever done an intro that quick. I, I will, just to pound it in your head, remind you that Pike Gear, 
Onyx, Boss Shot Shells, Waltons, Gunner Kennels, Garmin, W, Deck Drawer, Weatherby, Purina, K9 Athlete are all products that you can trust. Trust me. You don't have to trust me. Try them. You find them. And what am I? Like Publishers Clearinghouse for products? No. I know what's good. I've hunted with it. I've used it. Whatever it is in the dog world, I've seen it. I've done it. Yes, that sounds a little egotistical. But hey, at my age, how could I not have seen all this stuff? All right, Jared Wickland from Pheasants Forever jumped on, and we had fun. We, uh, he might be the guy that gets me to go to Arizona one day. You'll hear about that. But hunting from Montana to Minnesota, the bird reports, the snow reports, the, the events coming up, yeah, it was just fun. It was absolutely just fun. I love you guys. I love you girls, and I love you all more if I see you at Pheasant Fest. Have a good one. Boom. Hey, everybody. This is Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. I'm trying to light myself a little cigar and introduce you to Jared Wickland from Pheasants Forever. Jared and I uh, have known each other a few years now. We always see each other at Pheasant Fest, which we know is coming up. Um, we've hunted one. We hunted a day together, so we know we're of like mind. And I asked Jared <laughs> if he could come on and give us a little a little update on Pheasant Fest, on his season, on the Recovering North American Wildlife Ask, any and all the stuff that comes up in your job. So, Jared, I got to apologize. I don't remember your title because I just know you as Jared. All good. P Public Relations Manager for Pheasants okay. Forever and Foils Forever. So you do everything, in other words. Yeah, I do a little bit of everything. Do a lot of earned media, do advertising for Pheasant Fest, uh, do a lot of interviews, podcasts, obviously. I also do a lot of writing uh, for both the magazine, uh, for our blog series online. Um, yeah, a little, little, little bit of everything and got a, kind of a diverse background with started on the chapter side and then moved more towards our headquarters side. So I've kind of, I've, I've, I've had uh, been in both courts, I guess. Yeah. Um, so to, I mean, anybody who doesn't know this, the beginning of this is an unabashed commercial to come to Pheasant Fest, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, the Hunting Dog Podcast will be there. We have a nice big end cap booth space with some of my event, some of my sponsors. But I, I absolutely look forward to Pheasant Fest like a hunting trip because I'm like a lot of bird hunters. We're kind of social hunters as well, right? I Yep, yep. Meeting, yeah. meet, meeting people that you haven't seen in a long time. Um, putting names to faces for people that, you know, contact you on your podcast or contact oh. pheasants forever. I've met a lot of really great people that way. I actually, I actually hunted with a landowner in Iowa this year. We'd been contacted, you know, for six, seven years straight and finally said, Hey, why, why don't you come, why don't you come on down everything we've talked about and see, kind of see what I've done here with my property. So yeah, it's just a, it's a really great connection to the upland bird world. Right. And, you know, and if people haven't been there, like there's nobody that walks out of that show and goes, that was dumb. Cause I've yeah, been to some shows, <laughs> you know, and they're, they're like, really? We're, we're just here to, to just get some beef jerky, you know? Yeah. Um, from everything from the bird dog training stage with Purina and the habitat stage, the seminars, it, give a, give somebody, you have a little list of what all's going on in a nutshell there. Yeah, it's 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 less of a trade show and more of like a seminar series sports show um, that's full of hunting gear, shotguns, um, up, upland hunters of of every of every type that you're going to meet. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, um, bird dogs obviously are a huge attraction. So yeah. um, we've got the we've got the bird dog stage. Um, we've got uh, pollinator pathway to learn about pollinators and sort of that connection. And that's how we get a lot of people into the pheasants forever fold as well as, you know, the, the pheasant really defines us, but all those other species that we work on outside of the ring neck itself. So, and, and the Bob white quail. So yeah. uh, poll pollinators, grassland birds, uh, sage, sage grouse, sharp tails, Hungarian partridge. There's a, a lot of different things. We even work uh, in a lot of migration, uh, like mule deer uh, ranges now in, in Washington and in Montana um, and all that is to help keep grass on the landscape that also impacts birds in a really positive way. So, um, yeah, so there's pollinator pathway. We've got a bird dog trauma training session this year. Uh, David Gutierrez, uh, who is a representative uh, from the Southwest, kind of in Arizona, he used to be a green beret and he knows the guys that run sort of their canine units. We're putting on a, 
a trauma clinic this year that you can sign up for on our website at pheasantfest.org. Um, comes with a lifetime membership uh, for your bird dog and uh, just really teaches you all the ways for dealing with trauma on the field, whether that's taking a stick to the chest, you know, flipping over a barbed wire fence, um, falling down a ravine, whatever it might be. Um, that's a that's a pretty cool series that's going to run uh, Thursday through Saturday um, or Friday through Saturday, excuse me. Um, we've got the Grouse Trail this year, uh, which is sponsored by the North American Grouse Partnership. Um, that's, you know, every type of grouse we have in America, you can meet with those conservation groups. You can uh, meet with outdoors men and women who, who chase them religiously. Um, so that, that's pretty cool. We've got a landowner workshop, a film fest. We just got a lot of different things that I think people are going to like this year at Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic, which is February 17th through the 19th in Minneapolis. Yeah. You guys always did. There's always something you threw in. Like you said, the, uh, I got the email about that, the, the dog first aid course. Yeah. And I can't remember what time it was, but I was like, I, I can't go. I got, I can't be away from the booth for, you know, half a day, <laughs> but I was like, oh, I wish I could have, you know, I I'd pay a lot to go to that class. You know what I mean? Yeah, Plus, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think at first it's a little bit of a shot. I think it's a $500 price tag, but that comes with uh, like a half, half day training, uh, sends you home with a, like a homemade trauma kit. That's basically ready to go that you can put yeah. in your truck. Uh, like I said, it gives you that lifetime membership for your bird dog, uh, a, a bird dog lifetime membership, and uh, just gives you the knowledge that you're going to need in the field if yeah. you ever run into those types of situations. Yeah, yep. no, that that that's something, like I said, I, I'll probably be looking that guy up. I'm sure he does these throughout the country at some point too. And I'll be, I'll be digging into one of those. Yeah. yeah David, uh, his background as a green beret, uh, he's a hardcore bird hunter and just a, just a cool dude to get to know. So yeah, he'd, he'd love to come on and talk about I, uh, it. Uh, yeah. Maybe I could just have him come on the podcast and you know. Yeah. Yeah. He'd love that. Yeah. He'd love that. In touch with him with an email. It'd be great. Um, so yeah, I I'm looking forward to like, like I said, I look forward to this like a hunting trip because now I can't hang with a green beret hunting chuckers or anything like that, but I still like, <laughs> yeah, he's in good I, shape. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so I hope he doesn't invite me anywhere cause I would embarrass myself on my fatigue. <laughs> um, you know, we've, we've also got a lot of questions about like, uh, Friday upland rally, which is Friday night. Um, I think sponsored yeah. lining kugels and other people are in there, which, which is cool. So, um, and then we've got our sa Saturday night kind of national banquet. And right now, we're, uh, you know, a month ahead of time still, and all of that's sold out at like 1500 people right now. So things are moving in the right direction for Pheasant Fest. And I, I think it's just, it's going to be a huge celebration of of everything uh, that we, that we do and that we care about is Upland Hunters. Yeah. And, and I like what you said. It's, and I, I think that message has gotten out better from you guys, from RGS, from the Grouse Initiative. It, it I think back in the day, if you asked the question to a person that didn't know anything that pheasant pheasants forever was just about pheasants you really did think that you know what i mean yeah but it's gotten it, such it, it wasn't a bad review of it but i think just about anybody would understand when you bring in the habitat to from like i said the bees to the birds to the insects you could you could win the hearts and minds like you said you had a a, a rancher or a farmer you communicated with for years and this guy probably from the message decided to take his how was that did you go did you meet him or is that just a tentative? yeah his yeah his name is his name is rich berkland and we actually just out of the out of the blue he invited me down uh actually stopped down there a couple years ago but this time he invited us down to hunt and i actually threw it out we we auctioned off a a hunt with the flush that people are going to be able to see this coming year uh on the sportsman's channel um and we went down there for one of three days. Some guys from Texas bought the hunt on our online auction that supports call the uplands. And yeah, you know, Rich was a little bit hesitant at first, but he's got such a cool story. He's a seed dealer himself, uh, big into agriculture, but he, you know, the birds and the bees and the pheasants, he actually doesn't even hunt anymore. He just ha lets, you know, lets mostly his, his family and friends kind of come out. Wow. Um, and it was more of a, Hey, I'd, I'd really like to tell your story. And I, I remember this year um, it was, uh, November, November 17th, we were at his farm and they wanted somebody to, to post on the end of the field. You know, anybody with bird dogs, they don't like to post. They like right, to just, right, just right. walk, which is fine. So I said, Hey, I'll, I'll go and do it. I'll sit there and try to hold these birds in. And 
I watched probably 75, a lot of them, most of them hens, 75 birds, you know, uh, in a 30, 40 minute walk, just, just right, right past my face, you know, and oh, it's just, that. and to think that that field just a few years ago, um, was, you know, in a more of an agricultural setting and, and still is to some degree, but he's, he works in a little bit of CRP or some type of conservation program, a shelter belt every year. And uh, I think we shot a, I think it was a, it's not about limits, but it's just give you an idea. I mean, we shot a seven bird limit in pretty, pretty quick order that day. And, you know, the Texans that came along with us were just, their minds were just blown. I have never, never ever seen <laughs> birds like that. So you plant it and they come. That's, yeah. that's the yeah, that, bottom that's, line. That's a cool story. I mean, it's kind of like that. He's like that. I guess you'd call him that farmer that, just wants to see the picture of what it could and should look like, right? If you could, yep. if you could multiply him by a thousand, which really wouldn't be a lot compared to how many pieces of property there are in this country, right? Yep. If yep. you could multiply that by a thousand, everything would be in better shape. But yeah, and, and that's so true. And that's part of like why I want to be able to tell his story and be able yeah. to use that as an example of a guy. I mean, he was just straight corn and beans not that, right. that long ago. And they had some wet areas that they turned into, um, you know, wetlands surrounded by grassy cover. And he's got a nice, he had a four acre food plot this year that uh, was planted with sunflowers, uh, uh, beans and sorghum. And it's just like you're walking walking through that thing, and it's just it's just a wildlife buffet, you know. So it was yeah. it was pretty cool. But you're absolutely right when you talk about you know sometimes people see our logo with the pheasant on there, and they think you know well it's, it's a bunch of rednecks that want to go out and <laughs> chase 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 pheasants. And I'll, although there are some of us in there that love the the bird hunting and and the wild game meals that that it's it's so much more than that. I right. we 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 kill them or we hunt them because we, we love them. Right. It's that right. whole role of conservation and licenses. And, and, Oh, by the way, we're also providing a lot more public areas for, for birds and other wildlife to, to yeah. uh, reproduce, you know, yeah, because That's, the few, the few weekends, let's just say for average Joe, the few weekends yep. we get to hunt, what that guy did is a 365 day a year, plus to the oh yeah we we talk we talk weekly weekly yeah. he calls me like hey what do you think i can do this year you know what can i do differently and we talked about he had a he had a uh, a row of shrubs that wasn't very wide and it collected some snow but it, it needs to be a lot wider in order to like help help during during winter snowstorms and that was right. you know i said hey get a hold of our biologists and the dnr and maybe maybe this year You've, you've planted a lot of shrubs already, but let's, you know, maybe some dogwood or some American plum and let's really expand that thing out to a lot more rows to give it a lot more, a lot more value to, to, to wildlife around there. You know, so. I venture to say a few deer came out of that place too. And yeah, uh, we saw, else. <laughs> yeah. And on, on the deer note, we saw some absolute giants while we were down. It was, right. it was fun to see. And that, that's going to be part of the show too. I think we captured one that was probably a, a 14 point and obviously it it came off of a it came off of this little bottom slough that we were hunting and it was unfortunate because you know when a 14 pointer takes off bounding through the grass he lets everybody else know what's going on and the birds started just pouring out of this piece but <laughs> we, it was uh fun to see nonetheless <laughs> that reminded me we did a, a snow goose hunt once years ago over on the eastern shore and you know, snow geese, unless you're with somebody who really pinpoints them and knows them and has access for every field, we still went in and we paid a guy to go there and we weren't doing any good, right? Just, they weren't coming to us. And he goes, I, I got another spot. If you guys don't mind doing kind of a, a sneak up, right? Kind of a, we're going to go through the woods. Yep. We're going to come a, upon a, bl a blitzkrieg a is blitzkrieg. how I like to go. There you go. And, yeah. Yeah. We, we had this thing dialed in 30 <laughs> yards apart, guys on the edge. And guess what happened? Three deer come running out and went right through the whole flock of snow. Yeah. Camp. Huh? What? <laughs> so I'm sure, I'm sure them deer kicked up them pheasants on you. Like, you're not mad, but you're like, ah. <laughs> but that's what the good habitat's going to do. That happens, happened to me in North Dakota this year a bunch. Every time we found birds, we found mule deer. We found yep. that everything it's know. sort of that it's sort of that web of life and um you know with 
with the amount of acres that we have to work with, whether it's through some type of conservation program or people just doing it on their own, I guess sort of our motto is to make every acre the best it can be. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you can do that and we can string that together with some connectivity um, yeah. and, you know, you throw public and private lands into the mix and, you know, acquisitions and easements and just every, everything else, um, we try to create complexes. That's that's what we do at Pheasants Forever and Quilper. And obviously, we've we've got... Second to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we've got the most biologists for any organization in the country. It's up wow. over 325, 350 right now. That That's a free service to help people, um, you know, plan uh, their land use on their property. And we can't have what we have in this country without private landowners. It's a right. huge piece of the puzzle. But by the way, you know, we also we're working on public lands and creating complexes. And if we can do that, continue to create complexes um, and, and permanent protection, that's going to get us a long ways to making sure that we have viable wildlife populations for the future. Yeah, that is, I've tried, I wish I could explain it to you when I, when I get an email and somebody says they want to get into the dog bird dog world. Mm -hmm. and I, I generally say, and believe me, you can imagine, I get some people like, I found your show. I've always wanted to, what do I do? And the first thing I do is say, look, you need, you need some support team. There's got to be a PF or an RGS chapter, or a QF chapter. There's got to yep. be. Those we appreciate will, that. Those people will welcome you, like, like a, a starving person would welcome a sandwich, right? You'd be like, yeah, they're all bird. They're all bird dog owners too. Like they, they're the right. same mindset, which is and, what you're getting. At. <laughs> but they don't. Yeah, they don't think of going to an NGO, right? To to learn yep. something, you know. They're, they might be thinking that down the road. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. But they're thinking about the dog and like literally what you guys, for us dog lovers, it's it's always been about, yes, we say limits. And I, I don't find it creepy because pheasants to one bird, you could probably go out and get a limit in the right spot a lot. I used to all the time, you know. Yeah. yeah. My limits are limited by me now, you know. But yeah, no, I, I, it's it's such a... I don't know if it'll ever come back, but it seems like it is. It seems like in spite. Well, let's yak about Minnesota a little bit this year. You, you yeah, said no problem. Phenomenal, right? I mean, just yeah. I I think across I think across the upland bird range in general. So this year, I would define that as Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota. I hunted Montana as well in portions where there were a lot of pheasants. Um, and there's, you know, pockets in other places too, like uh, Nebraska. I saw some some uh, good numbers coming out of Kansas in certain places. But for the most part, you know, we've had a nice run here of gentle winter weather, uh, good good spring weather. Um, and when that happens, um, you know, you put those pieces together and you have upland birds. So Minnesota was absolutely my daughter's, <laughs> this is my daughter, Grace. She's tapping on my shoulder. You need to go upstairs right now. No, no, <laughs> go. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, obviously, Minnesota was a great time this year. A um, lot of birds. Um, you know, I sent you down there in places, I think, or gave, gave you a tip of where to go. That yep. southwest corner is always good. Um, and there's a lot of places, too, where you can get up north now where as – you know, we've had sort of a, a warmer weather over the years. Um, the upland bird range is actually starting to move more north. You've got more agriculture up there, and right. you're getting birds that kind of cross over into the rough grouse range as well. So there's really good populations in certain yeah. places, and Minnesota was obviously one of those this year. Iowa, too. Iowa was just absolutely phenomenal when I was down there. And for all these years, I keep driving another four or five hours to the Dakotas, right? I've got to make use of the the price of gas and the logistics of, of hitting Minnesota yep. and hitting Iowa, you know. It's... Yeah, if you're gonna take a trip um, to any of these, you know, upland bird destinations, North Dakota and South Dakota were also very good this year too. Sure. The further north you went, kind of following following the moisture we got to restore what we lost from the drought, the better it was. Um, but all those different states, if you have if you have the time, um, whether you take time up from work or you're retired. Um, I really recommend to people are like, you know, I'm coming up for two to three weeks. You know, what would you do? It's like, yeah, it's the slice of life. Like take, take, a, take a little bit from, you know, yeah. each one of those States. They're, they're all a little bit different in their own. Right. 
Yeah. Um, and I, you know, obviously I, I get it. Licenses cost something, gas costs something. Everything um, costs. Yeah. Yeah. But for bang for your buck, if, if you have the means to do it, um, you know, v- variety, I think is nice. And all those States provide a little something different. Yeah. And you know, I won't, I won't, I won't hotspot this, but uh, when you gave me some advice and I couldn't make the trip, some friends of mine made the trip yep. and they literally, I think it was either in a, in a grocery store or a gas station, they saw a little, you know, a little ad on a bulletin board for a, a place to rent. Right. Yep. And it was like, I, it was like what I experienced 30 years ago with, by just walking into town, somebody said, Oh, you know what? I think they'll rent their house or this guy literally put these people up and gave them, they didn't allow the dogs in the house. So that's fine. Right. Yeah. All good. The guy gave him his garage, which is heated. Yeah. All of his duck decoys, all of his boats. And yep. they put all their kennels in the garage and they didn't know this guy from Adam. Yep. Right. And it was, I, I don't, and not, I'm talking about money. We're not even talking a lot of money. No, I mean, I mean look, th- there's there. Yeah. There's places I would say like vacation rental by owner VRBO is a really great source for bird hunters right now. Like yeah. you can get places in, in be like smack dab in the middle of the primary pheasant range, good right. populations, quality public land for anywhere from, I've seen it from 50 to like $90 a night and comparative. Right. And that comes with like Wi-Fi, a hot shower. A lot yeah. of them have either yeah. a little kitchenette or a microwave or something. And then, oh, by the way, yeah, you can use my heated garage to make sure that your dogs are comfortable. Boom. Right. I mean, that's yeah. that's a lot better to me than you know. Sometimes I love hotels that you can that are on the first floor with a door on the outside. You know yeah. that you can the drive your truck right up to. Yeah, the old mom yeah, pop motels. Yeah, exactly. It's great. And then there's other ones too that they're bird dog friendly, but. Um, you know, after you towed all your stuff inside and, you know, go up to the second level, whatever it might be, um, you know, it can, it's not, not that big of a headache, but at the end of a long day, uh, it, it does make a difference. So yeah, those, those places are, are nice to find. They're yeah, gems. I, so, yeah. I really want people to know that you, you got to do a little homework, but you have to do that with whatever you're doing, you know, whatever yep. you get a dog, you got to learn to train it. You, you know, it, it's not like you're, if you live in Ohio, you know, you're not going to go out and wild bird hunt. Right, you just. Yep. But I'll bet you see a ton of Ohio license plates. Although I do got a, another funny story. I got I got lumped in with Minnesota hunters this year. Yeah. So I was in South Dakota, <laughs> and there was a blue platers is what we call. That's what he said. That's what he yeah. said. <laughs> and I kind of confronted him, and because myself included, had a blue plate, and you guys, he goes, "Oh, you Minnesota and Michigan guys." Why don't you just go somewhere else? And I was like, we're on public land here. He yeah. got he got miffed because when we pulled up, we saw him walking away, like let's just say going straight north. Yeah. Right? It was grass. I couldn't see his dogs. He had no orange on, which I think in North Dakota, I think you can do that. I don't know. I don't re- I don't remember. If not, I wish I would have turned him in. Anyway, so we weren't gonna hunt that. That, that was a, a, a WMA. And then there was a piece of state land, you know, cut off by a fence and a gate. I said, mm-hmm. well, let's go hunt this. We only got an hour. Let's go hunt this piece. And he somehow looped around counterclockwise. And we basically started coming toward each other. Yeah. So I'm like, middle. oh, that's the guy we saw. Me and my buddy, we just turned around. I kind of waved. And we just walked back to our truck. Now, that's pretty polite, right? Yeah, I mean, yep. you know, we we gave him. I said, okay, I didn't know he was gonna make a. Although I should be able to go hunt there too, he came back to his truck and gave us the blue plate speech, and I wanted to go back and arm wrestle this guy. And you know what I mean by arm wrestle this guy, <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, look, you live here and you don't have any private places with some friends to go. You know, you got to come here and make out of staters feel bad. Oh, it was it was. I'm sure it's happened to a lot of people. Public land was busy this year. I'm guessing that was, was that more towards the beginning of the season? It was November. It was November. November. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. still <clears throat> public land was a busy place this year. And, and that's why I, I really like uh, hunting either during, during the week. And I hold reserved a lot of PTO time <laughs> to do it. Um, 
either during the week uh, or later on in the season when we get some snow. Um, the end of the season, like we've we've had so much snow, and that's probably a good thing to talk about too, and kind of what's going on out there right now. But we had yeah. so much snow at the end of the year. Um, I saw a lot of people on the different forums and Facebook groups that I'm on just just sort of hanging it up. I mean, there's just sig- significant snowfall, um, yeah. especially Minnesota and the Dakotas and Montana. It was significant. Yeah. We got that, but it it's it was here for a week. We got lucky. We got that that it came under the lake and but we got dumped on. But yeah. So what is what is that like for the birds now? Like is it hard, crusty? Is it or is the the weather mild enough where it's on its side right now? I think it depends where you go. Um anytime you get uh you know, rain, snow, sleet, ice mix followed by heavy wet snow, which is what we got with that storm of the century. I forget the name of the storm that they gave it. They gave it a first name. I I just called it a a real whopper. Um, (laughs) But anytime you get that followed by heavy wet snow, followed by temperatures that, you know, basically go sub zero um, that storm lasted in a lot of locales. And I've talked to people in South Dakota, uh, Minnesota, uh, Eastern Montana, Iowa didn't get hit too bad. Northwest Iowa starting to see some snow pile up a little bit here. But for the most part, Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Montana, where we have like our best up on bird populations right now, we're right right, right in the eye of that storm. And yeah. uh, both from a severity standpoint and then the longevity of it. So like four, four days in a row of like blizzard yeah. conditions is not good for upland birds. I mean, it really sacked a lot of, uh, a lot of winter habitat, particularly cattail sloughs. And even at my house out back here, um, there's still some pockets where they're able to get, get in there and, you know, get out of the harsh yeah. weather. And um, so I'm, but we're seeing big groups of upland birds. We have heard of some mortality, um, but we we're just kind of going through a January thaw here right now, which is maybe not thaw is maybe not the best word, but we're, you know, getting up into the 30 and 40 degree temperatures for a couple of days to feels allow those good. birds to, yeah, it feels great. And hopefully allows those birds to pack on um, a little fat, but yeah, they're, they're feeling it. You know, yeah. you get a, you get a lot of people that call in and say, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm seeing hundreds of birds. Things are looking great. And it's like, well, eh, maybe not so much. They're stressed out. And that's why you're seeing them in those places. And we've actually been getting a, a ton of feeding inquiries right now. A lot of them, um, which, an example, which isn't good. Like, what, what would they, they're literally writing an email to like, what can I do to feed the birds? Is that what they're? Yep. I was getting two or two or three a day here. Um, you know, after those storms, what, Hey, um, I, uh, I'm a landowner, you know, next, next to a public area or something like that. And, uh, I'm worried about, I'm worried about my pheasants and do you guys have, you know, shelled corn that, that I could feed them. Um, and, we got so many, in fact, that we've, we've sent out some guidance now to like all of our, cause our field staff are getting it too. And, right. you know, right. at the end of the day, um, we, we do not recommend supple, supplemental feeding, um, or just, they're, they're basically bait piles, right. Is what people are, people are talking sure. about. Sure. Um, and at the end of the day, there's a lot of well-intentioned people out there, uh, that are trying to do the best thing they can for the birds, but a a pile of cracked corn or what have you uh, isn't going to save them. In a lot of cases, like it's pulling them out of winter cover, it becomes a predator trap because predators know they're going there too. Oh yeah. Uh, when you start something like that, you have to continue it for the full year or for for the rest of the the winter harsh season, or you're based you're kind of signing a death warrant for wildlife by right. drawing them in and then not being able to keep it up. Like if we have another bad snowstorm. Um, and then lastly would be in a lot of places right now, chronic wasting disease in deer, it makes oh. it illegal to even do those activities, which is oh, yeah. the other aspect of it. So we really, um, we really don't promote that. So people say, well, well, what can I do? Well, you need to plan for winter habitat and that's a, a block food and cover plot, whether that's, you know, sorghum or sedan grass or whatever it might be, corn food plots and yeah. th- three to 10 acres in a block format takes care of that problem. And if you, if you don't have that winter cover um, or you don't, you know, have cattails or some type of uh, shrub, shrub planting, native shrub right. planting to help get them through, um, you know, that can, that can be a problem. It can be a real right. problem. You'd almost want to, in a, in a tongue in cheek manner, you'd want to save those emails and just have your biologist show up with a planter and a plan say, 
Oh, here you you wrote us back in uh, January. We're here. We're gonna yep. we're gonna yep. show you how and, to save these birds. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, again, well intentioned people that want to do the right thing. But you and I were talking a little bit before the podcast, and I just want to mention this and that here's a here's a great example of why we don't do those types of things. So yeah. I yeah. had a snowplow driver from Southwest Minnesota. I got a I got a tip that he had. Uh, run into some birds out on the road. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about it. So I gave him yeah. a call. Uh, I won't say the county, but down in Southwest Minnesota, lots of birds out on the landscape right now. And he said, uh, he's got a 30 mile plow route that he does for the county. Right. And, um, you know, for a couple, for the first couple of weeks after those storms or whatever, or a couple of days after even, um, he's going along and somebody's dumping like little, like uh, milk pail sized piles of, corn along the side of the road <laughs> well-intentioned want to help the birds like they're coming up there and getting out the problem is is that number you're pulling away from winter cover and you're putting them in harm's way like he's telling me he's he's hitting them with the plow right um and then any of the corn that is there you know he he can't stop because he's pushing 10 oh. to 12 inches of wet snow off the side of the road so he's basically covering he's covering that stuff which is freezing over the birds aren't getting it anyways and he's actually he's hitting them with heavy wet slush as he's pushing it off the roadside so that's just a prime example of like how and why we 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 don't feed the birds like they've got native sources too so for instance at, at my house crab apples they're they're choking them down one after another right now. Really? Um, in, in addition to, you know, the kind of the food and cover plots that I have out back, but right. they're, they're finding a way to live. If you watch them, they're out picking on these nice days um, yeah. and they're, they're figuring it out. So that's why we tell people to just leave them alone mm-hmm. and plan for the worst and hope for the best. And that that's where people can come to Pheasant Fest and set you up with a, a conservation plan that's going to help those types of things. Right, right. You, there are plenty of time to walk the aisles and see all the breeds of dogs in the new shotgun shells, but you could really get some solid planning done. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, Taking a look at that aerial view and meeting with a trained biologist um, and then sending you back home and having a biologist in, in your specific region coming out and walking that ground with you right. in the spring and planning those habitat projects out. Yeah. It's important. I, I had a note on my pad here to ask about the the Wickland wildlife uh, area, because <laughs> I, when you met, when I met you, you said you were doing some habitat. You didn't have a lot of property, but you were doing some habitat work. Yeah. And, I've got, uh, I've only got 10 acres. Um, right. And for folks that have heard this before, sorry, I'll, yeah. I'll talk about I it. I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm proud of it, but you know, I try to keep as much nesting habitat on the landscape as I can. Um, that's the number one limiting factor for pheasants. Uh, yeah. You know, basically we can talk about food plots and all that kind of stuff all we want, but at the end of the day, the majority the majority of the upland bird range is one is one huge food food plot, especially in places yeah. like Iowa, uh, yeah. the pheasant range in Minnesota, the Dakotas. Like there's there's yeah. a lot of agricultural landscape out there for them to choose from. Um, so, I I do do a food plot and it's to or cover plot I guess and it's to help with winters like this. So right now I've probably got thirty to forty. Um, you know, resident wildlife that have sort of come in looking looking for a place to call home here during this harsh weather. And I've done uh, I've done some shrub plantings um, that are in the beginning stages right now, but um, starting to produce berries and those types of things. And um, yeah, you know, I I do what I can. I, I try to help out my neighbors um, and provide them advice and. Even though we're in the Twin Cities here, we've got a a, a very nice population of pheasants right now. What yeah, it's gonna cool. look look what it's gonna look like after this winter weather, um, <laughs> I'm not totally sure. But I shot a, a number of you know thick, healthy roosters out there this year, yeah. And uh, passed on a passed on a few deer, uh, which was fun. Uh, got a turkey, so yeah, it's uh it's a labor it's a labor of love. Yeah, that's cool. When you said crab apples, I. I'm thinking of like grouse hunting with the thorn apples. They're really small. Yeah. Is a crab apple that small too? Or am I thinking like a dwarfy eaten apple? I I think it depends. I think it depends on the variety. Yeah. Okay. But the ones that they're focusing on in this uh, crab apple tree, I don't even know. I don't know what variety it is, but they're probably little probably about the size of a nickel, maybe, maybe a little right. smaller. And uh, every, every day at, you know, nine o'clock in the morning you can look outside and they're sitting in that tree just picking out of it and (laughs) so uh, just they're taking them down just like uh 
a rose hip or a, a grouse takes an acorn. They're just yeah, or yeah, mount, mountain ash, whatever it might be. Yeah, you know, that's it, cool. Yeah, they're uh, hey, they they find just to look out the morning and see the bird you love. You know? Yeah, it's it's fun. It's fun to see. I've actually got a I've got a video on my phone that I took of uh, six roosters that came walking down. Um, I wouldn't call it a shelter belt, but a tree line next to the house yesterday, and they're they're uh, big and they look totally fine, and they're just hanging out, kind of following each other around, and the hens yeah. were off in a food plot doing their thing. So it, it was nice to see they're they're surviving despite uh, you know odds stacked against them with some of the snow that we've received. That's cool. Give me some uh, dog updates. Has anything changed in your dog world? Because I'm not going to remember the names, but I know you have more than one. Yeah, not really. Uh, Jackson, the English pointer, uh, he's going to be 11 here at the end of this month. Um, so he's he's an old guy that gets pampered by my kids, the one that came in there uh -huh. a little earlier on. Jaxy Bobo, he, uh, yeah, he gets a lot of treats and stuff. But he did well, you know. Um, some of those older dogs – you just kind of learn how long they can take in the field. And for him, it's really not quite, not anywhere close as long as it used to be. But I brought him to Montana this year and ran him for about a, a two hour stint, uh, just one afternoon. Yeah. And he kind of showed the, showed the younger dogs a thing or two, which <laughs> yeah. puts us, puts a smile on your face, you know? Yeah. So he's good. And then I've got Luna, uh, which is the British, uh, black British lab. And, yep. uh, She's doing great. Um, haven't had any injuries or anything. And she kind of takes the the brunt of the bird hunting work right now. And um, when I've got, you know, shorter, shorter time frames and, and um, you know, want to do those types of things, I, I get, uh, I get old Jaxie out. So they're doing great. Um, fighting with my wife and my kids right now about what our next dog is going to be. Um, I could help you with that. Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've kind of looked at, um, uh, uh they they kind of want something more along the lines like a golden retriever. They've talked about a husky. I've had one of those growing up. I have no interest in kind of a wonderful dog. I just have no interest in going back there. If I'm going to take care of it, I, I'd like to find something that can be good at home and good in the yeah. field. So hey, I've kind of been looking at uh, Nova Scotia duck tolling retrievers. Um, I think they're, <laughs> I see your face. I, I think they're, <laughs> I think they're beautiful. Um, and uh, they, uh, they can get it done in the field. I've hunted behind a few. Um, but then I, then I think like, well, when Jackson passes away, I'm not going to have a pointer in the house anymore. And yeah. I really like kind of having that dual threat just based on weather conditions and kind of right. what I'm looking for that day and what the terrain is. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. More, more to come on my home, my home battle turf that I'm about to go through here in the next couple of years. But yeah, that's, that's where I'm at for dogs right now. And it's just been a real joy watching the old yeah. one and the young one working together. Yeah, I remember both of them. We had a lot of fun in that woodcock, woodcock and grouse woods up there with your. Oh yeah. Yeah. And the bear encounter. I remember yeah, that. Like it was I yesterday. told that story to so many people. They're like, what? I go, yeah. It looked like the two of us were doing like an Abbott and Costello. Yeah. Like, well, you go in there. No, you go in there. I'll keep the can. I'll keep the phone handy in case it's alive. You know. No, you go in there. And both of us were like, "Is it sleeping?" Is okay. It I felt like Elmer Fudd. I I think <laughs> I see a bear it's going into the going in, but he he was he was passed away already. Thankfully. Yeah, so. but he wasn't old. He wasn't passed no. long. No. No. Long. No. Have you? And this is just self-serving question. Have you been back to that area? Because that was an area that shocked me because we literally saw sharp tails and pheasants yep. on the way to go grouse hunting it's not not that far from the twin cities either which no, is awesome no, um, that's all we're saying but have you been back there honestly i i didn't make it up there this year um it, that's we've talked about before like that's a pheasants pheasants forever project on the outside where you can get you know sharp tail woodcock rough grouse and pheasant right. all in the all in the same kind of mile um stretch but no I, I didn't make it back up there but the the rough grouse bird hunting in general this year it doesn't really matter the species yeah was excellent um yeah. from my point of view i mean Min i hunted minnesota and wisconsin um um for pheasants and grouse uh western wisconsin believe it or not was actually pretty stacked for pheasants this year too um really? they're they're experiencing kind of the same thing people are like man i'm seeing a lot of pheasants out right now i was like well wow. they're a little bit they're a little bit stressed they're congregated but the yeah. rough grouse and woodcock hunting was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I mean, I even had people calling me that know that I, you know, grew up in Duluth, hunted up north a lot. I had some guys call from 
uh, from Nebraska and said, Hey, first time rough grouse hunting. It's kind of a bucket list item for us. They were, I don't know, probably, I think they're maybe in their mid fifties trying to figure it out. And I said, Hey, why don't you stop in, you know, it's no secret. Southwest Minnesota has got nice pheasant population. I said, stop yeah. there. You can shoot some pheasants. You can kind of keep coming. You can shoot some woodcock on your way up. And they went up to, uh, to, to Northern Minnesota and I gave them a few spots to focus on said, Hey, you can stay here. You can hunt this, you know, two, 3 million acres. And the first day they called me back and said, we didn't see a single bird. And I go, well, I was literally just up there and I saw 10 of them just driving. So <laughs> and they go, well, it was, it was pouring rain today. I go, oh, well, there's your, there's your problem, you know, yeah. but yeah. the next day they, they actually, they all, they shot limits of, of rough grouse, which was, which was great. Oh, that's fantastic. So help people find the, find some success. I think that's, yeah. that's another well, part of being and I'm part not of trying to give your phone number out, but I mean, it sounds like people are just like, I want to say strangers. I'd like to think at that point, they've already joined pheasants forever, but yep. I mean, to, it almost sounds funny that you'd be in con, like you'd have so much work to do with your job. You guys are still like, you're, you're kind of like calling the Like I used to call the DNR office, like, Hey, you know, where should yeah. I go for this? It's amazing that you guys can do that. It to some, yeah. level, I don't say that you're, that's not your service shingle, but no, it's not. But anybody who knows me and I do a lot of these different podcasts and those types of things know that I, I don't necessarily like to like like to hotspot. Like if you say a region like Southwest Minnesota, like that's big. It, it's pretty well known to people. Like it's not, you know, that's where the majority of of hunters go. But anybody who calls me, like I'm happy to share an Onyx pin. Uh, I got a lot of them to places that I I hunt all the time. And that are always going to have birds, you know, uh, could be grouse hunting where I grew up, up north. Um, I mean, there, there's three, there's like a couple million acres to choose from. It's not like, you know, it's really any big secret. So yeah, anybody that ever, ever wants to call me, you feel free to put my number in the notes or we can <laughs> tell it here. But honestly, I help a lot of people. Out, um, and that's part of our jobs too, is like, we're going to have upland bird hunters for the future. And especially people that are just starting out. Right. Um we have to help them find success. And we just did a podcast the other day, Bob St. Pierre and I from Pheasants Forever with uh, Ken Yang, who's at Minnesota Hunter. I don't know if you know Ken at all, but he's an adult onset hunter, kind of represents, he wants to be a representative for the Hmong community to get more people into pheasants and conservation and hunting right. in general. And we talked about that too, is like, you know, a lot of people are tight lipped on their spots. Um, we are to some degree, but I am still willing to, to help a, an upland hunter out help to steer find success to, yep. steer to an area you're you're not gonna that's go, all part of well, it come up 94 and take a right and you're not going to shoot them over to you know the shore like michigan <laughs> yeah go go talk to roger on the corner no right, right, you know right. we're not going to do that but well i'm you know happy to point out some pins like this area um you know you can get on these back roads uh look for this type of habitat and then get out yeah. and start hunting and I, I i've never had a person call back and be like yeah, you gave me shitty information. Right, <laughs> you know, right, it's right. it's all been pretty good. Yeah. So yeah, because to to be transparent, I've I've leaned on you at least twice to say, "Hey, Jared, I'm cutting yeah. through this part," and you're like, "Here's a spot. I saw some birds. All Just, good. Yeah, all good. Yeah. yeah. Anybody? If anybody ever wants to, if anybody ever wants to email me, it's just jwikland at pheasantsforever.org. Shoot yeah. me an email. Happy to help. Yeah. Um. I I did that with a fella that. He was, I got this letter. I always find they're all so the same. And then one sticks out. He says, my wife and I have a dog or my future wife and I have a dog. We're planning a honeymoon. We want to go to the UP for a hunting, a hunting moon, hunting moon. Yeah. It's a hunting. I've heard that just recently. <laughs> Who did I hear that from? I did. I heard that. Um, and I literally gave him a spot by the campground where I camp when I go grouse hunting. Yep. I said, I said, I will tell you, I saw wolf tracks there last time I was there, but um, you could probably find wolf tracks all over Minnesota. And yeah. North you can find pretty much anywhere. Right. North, right. Northern half of the state. Yeah. And I it, even it, drew him a little map. Like you come out of the campground, there's a dirt hill, go over that dirt hill and you'll see thorn apples. They may or may not be in, you know, they might not be a good year. He wrote me back. He says, I can't believe you gave me that spot. I'm like, well, I couldn't go there. Why yeah. not? You know, yeah. I, 
Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not that secret guy either. You know, I, um, it, yeah, I wouldn't Again. give a personal friend spot out, but if yeah. it's a place that I know of, you know, yep. uh, yeah, I, I steer them there all the time. Yeah, more than willing to share spots and helping people find success is a, a big part of what we do to, you know, recruit re, or retain, recruit, and reactivate. So. Yeah, yeah. Touch a little bit on the two things we talked about, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which you said kind of got stalled, and then the, the grassland stuff. I know PF and all the groups are highly engaged with that. Yeah, you know, even if, it, whether you're a Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever member or any of the other groups or not, um, I think advocacy is something that's underrated in this country. When we have a bunch of voices speaking, and that's how we got the Great America Outdoors Act done here uh, about a year or two ago. It was a huge boon uh, for wildlife in a lot of different ways, but uh, the North American Grasslands Conservation Act is modeled after NACA, uh, which is the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. Um, and basically, it's a separate pot of money that's going to be used to restore uh, grasslands and upland bird areas uh, for, for grassland throughout the United States. Right. Uh, big, big bill got introduced into the Senate um, uh, in end of July. And, you know, trying trying to get it through, nothing happens fast uh, in politics. Uh, I guess sometimes it does. But, um, you know, in this case, uh, conservation is something that we need to continue to work at every single day, every single American yeah. that, that cares about bird hunting. Um, yeah. So between uh, the North American Grasslands Conservation Act and then RAWA, which is Recovering America's Wildlife Act, two huge pieces of legislation that would do wonderful things for upland birds. They stalled out at the end of the year. We tried tried to get one of them included in the the omnibus sp spending bill, which a lot of people heard about at the end of the year. But there just wasn't enough votes there. So it's kind of kind of back to the drawing table a little bit. We've got some new people coming into Congress. We're trying to figure out um, who we can bring over to kind of our side of the aisle, if you will, yeah. Um, yeah. to to who can help us move forward these conservation minded investments and. Um, you know, like we talked about at the beginning of the show, it's not just about grasslands and upland birds. This is this is uh, water quality. This is carbon sequestration. Uh, right. You know, these these bills have a lot to do uh, with with climate. Honestly, I mean, they yeah. grasslands store a ton of carbon. So mm -hmm. uh, you, that's how we need to sell it. And uh, when when we start firing things back up, we're going to be sending out email alerts. If you haven't signed up for our on the wing newsletter. Go to yeah. pheasantsforever.org or quailforever.org. You can sign up right in the middle of the page um, or a, a sign up will you know, pop up when you go to those websites. But impactful legislation that we continue to work on. And, and those are kind of our big, uh, big things moving forward here for 2023. Yeah. You know, you said, the, I think the key word is, and I heard, um, well, I'll, I'll leave the names out and not because I, I don't want to misquote somebody. Yeah. But this person said, I could we could have less hunters if we had more advocacy, like, because it's really about the, what we said in the beginning, the part we love is the bycatch of making things right on the, on the globe. Yep. Like, it's really what it is. Sure. <laughs> in, in a, in a, in a bird dog owner's mind is like, and there'll be more birds, but, <laughs> but we yeah. really gotta, we really gotta think big picture. This isn't, th none of that stuff is, going to go through congress because somebody's a pheasant hunter it's going to go through congress no and it, it, it can't it can't be that narrow yeah. of a thought right honestly it's, it's about like you said the what the the wetlands act did because we were in yep. a, a pickle with wetlands right and you you get now any company who builds a complex if nothing else they have to have like a little wetlands area you know for the way they move water around because now they got 80 acres of parking lot or something, right? Yeah. Like Wetlands Act, it, it had to make a huge impact, right? Yeah, here's a great example of that. The 2022 State of the Birds report came out, which is sort of like the report that people look to to see trending. Grassland bird trends, basically every single one of them, down. Yeah. It's going down because we just don't have enough. But you look right. at you look at what was done, you know, 30, 40 years ago with, with NACA and, and the, the wetlands funding, kind of a separate pot to support wetlands, shorebirds, those types of things. Yeah. Um, all of those are at, at really high levels. And it's like, well, we'd like to do the same thing on right. the grassland side. And it's right. it's pheasants and sharptails and sage grouse and Hungarian partridge. 
lesser prairie chicken who were just added in some locales to the endangered species list. Right. We're working hard to try to bring these birds back, but advocacy, we, we need more support on that side. Yeah. So even if you, you know, don't want to be a member of some of these wonderful groups that we have out there, including ours, um, the least you can do is put your voice to work uh, when we send out some of those right. action alerts. Yep. Right. And it, and you guys make it these days, you know, I'm said you, you could do the, the quick response so your congressperson or your senator knows your wishes. And when they get enough of them, that it resonates with them. Yep. And, and I've heard yep. one step better is actually, you know, making the call and writing your, you could use the, like the blank email that you guys will like, I support this, but put a personal touch to it. And yep. I, I mean, like when I had a biologist on once that was, we were talking about grouse, I, I got in uh I didn't get in any trouble for this, um, but I had one bad email or one bad review on iTunes because I said, next time I go in the woods, if I don't see an RGS sticker on your truck, I'm going to key scratch your truck. Of course, that's me being sarcastic, right? <laughs> well, Lisa... Lisa Williams, who is the <laughs> biologist in Pennsylvania, yeah. uh, leading the rough grouse, she says, I'll do it one better, Ron. I'll flatten their tires for you. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, we... So he took it personally. <laughs> yeah, it's some one person just like, I can't believe you would do that. I'm like, oh, you know what? I hope you're not a hunter. I hope you're just a troll. <laughs> because, but it's it's almost, you almost feel like, and I, you, I, you know, I've said this. I've said it on Bob's show. I've probably said it on everyone we've done. And I say it when I give, I give a maybe one or two talks a year somewhere. And I said, if you don't support the organization that supports the bird you chase, you're, you're just using, you know. You're, yeah. You're, a box of shells, a tank of gas is way beyond what most companies are asking for for a simple membership you know um it, you, you know as well as i do that you know conservation has some wonderful funding mechanisms like from our side of the fence um you you've got you know grants that support some larger grass and work with is great you've got the corporate supporters out there like you just you know mention one of the ammunition like right federal federal goes above and beyond what they do as an organization to make sure that, you know, the excise taxes. And then beyond that, there's, they support a whole slew of different groups out there, including right. pheasants forever and quail forever. Right. But at the end of the day, we don't have as many funding mechanisms as we need to support world-class wildlife populations. And that's where, you know, advocacy and those types of things come in, come in huge. We need people speaking up uh, for the, for the grassland. You need to be like the Lorax, right? Like I, I speak for the grasslands or I speak for right. the trees. Like that's, that's, right. that's who we see ourselves as. And, and that, um, that conglomeration of support, I guess, comes from members. It comes from the bottom yeah. up. It's not, it's not, the, it's not a top down approach. Right. You can't do it without that. You need that base nope. pyramid of members. Yep. So we need people. How so. did, uh, not to get too into the weeds, since since things are back to normal and, and banquets are being held, yep. uh, membership numbers holding or, or improving, or can we do? Yep. We to, so do we need to flatten some tires? <laughs> Pheasants forever and quail forever. We've made a concerted effort here to kind of change the way we're doing things or be more deliberate about. I think a lot of it comes down to is just like asking somebody. That's the biggest thing we hear is like, you know, why why in our surveys like why aren't you a Pheasants forever quail forever member? Yeah, I've never been asked. So, okay. so be it. Like we, we're we're happy to ask. So, um, no, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, we are back to we are back to where we were. The twenty thousand members that we lost, we we just hit that benchmark um, coming back from where we were uh, before, basically March through September twenty twenty. Yeah. Um, oh, that's so. Great. That's yep, great. things things are building back, and we need it more than ever. I'm I'm not going to say that you know upland birds are uh, are in a lot of trouble here, um, but we have heard like they've dealt with some really really tough winter conditions in the primary pheasant range that we have right now. Um, right. So have you know all the other wildlife that are out there. So this sure. might be a building back year after you know three years of, yeah, of wonderful that's weather that's kind of created a boom for for birds, if you will. But um, yeah. You know, these things happen in the North Country, and 
uh, we're going to be building back. And, you know, membership is one of those. We, 90 cents of every dollar goes right back into the ground. And we're <clears> extremely <throat> proud of that fact. Yeah, you you have to be. I, I'll mention something else that um, if I have to edit this because it's uh, it's been publicly announced, you have a, a new CEO now. Yes, yes, we do. No, you're you're good. Uh, we announced. I know, it, I know uh, it's out there, but I didn't know. Yeah. If you were like, oh, let's not talk about anything. You know. No, all good. We announced it on Monday. Um, Maryland Vetter, I think, in the bird dog world, she is very well known. Uh, yeah. She and her husband run Sharpshooter Kennels uh, out of New Richmond, Wisconsin. Um, she's a uh, just a w- wonderful person in general. Big upland bird hunter. Um, she's a businesswoman, you know, helped, uh, help take startups to, you know, multi-billion dollar corporations. She's got that business mindset yep. that comes in and, uh, we back her up with, uh, sort of the science background. And that's why we have, you know, chief conservation officers and those types of things. Right. So right. I've spent a lot of time with her in the last week and a half here. Um, they, you know, wrote some bigger stories about her and the star tribune, um, in Milwaukee yeah. journal, I think is putting one out, um, some of her own alma maters and places where she used to live. And she's just, uh, she's going to be a wonderful representative for us. And we're very happy to have her. Yeah. I can tell you, I've known her over 20, 20, maybe 25 years. And, uh, the way, the way that woman works, <laughs> yeah. if, if what she, what she could do, in or in our organization of NAVDA back in the day, I would tell you that she'll she'll get the Recovering America's Wildlife Act done if she has to go to right to cap right to the Capitol. She she's a go <laughs> she's a go getter. No. You know that was one of the questions that uh, I think Outdoor Life and others asked of her. Like you know when it comes to advocacy, what are you going to do? And she's like, oh, oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna be in the trenches along with our staff and our members. Like that's oh. what she she has a lot of years behind her of basically yeah. going, going to the state house and lobbying for yeah. um, the things that, that, that she was involved with for work. Right. So um, yeah, she's, she, she's not afraid to, afraid to put her foot down and go represent uh, pheasants forever, quill forever and our members um, in, in Congress. And I expect her to do so in not too short of a time. She doesn't actually start till February 1st and she's actually on her way. She's actually on her way down to before she starts uh, to hunt in Mern's country down in, down in Arizona. So yeah. that's yeah, cool. That's a, a North Dakota girl and guy that uh, yeah, they're, they're, it's the real deal. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yep. Yeah. The there deal. she's hardcore bird hunter, which is great to have. So, so that's cool. That was, uh, and you guys don't have, that's what was it? Only the third CEO of, of, uh, yep. in, but, in the history. Yep. Third CEO. We had, uh, we had Jeff, Jeff Fenden and then, uh, Mr. Howard Vincent, uh, right. our current and sort of outgoing here in June. Um, you know, he started in 2000. Um, and yep, Marilyn's the third CEO, um, first female CEO, which I think is is big news too. Um, and we're really excited what she's kind of bringing to our Women on the Wing initiatives and and those yeah. types of things. So she's, she's yeah, force. she's she's got great reviews. Um, it was one of the largest, uh, it was one of the largest Facebook posts I think we've ever done. And it was nothing but solid reviews for people yeah. that, that know her and have heard of her. So we're and, and excited. If, if to you're add ever going to get something goofy, it'll be on a Facebook review, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it passed, passes the test. So, do you know, if, uh, if, will she be speaking at the banquet or anything as the new incoming president? Yep, on Saturday night at Pheasant Fest, um, she she is going to give a a, a short speech. Um, at that point, it'll be two weeks into her job, but I think she's going to give a little bit of the vision um, as she sees it. But she's already told uh, you know reporters this and stuff is she doesn't Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever isn't like the wheel isn't broke, right? She's coming in, taking it over in a really great position, uh, right. both from a. You cut out or I cut out. Hold on. Oh, president and CEO. And that's part of the process that we went through with her um, and the board went through when, when they were hiring her. Yeah. I'm tick. I'm tickled about it. I am. Tick- yeah. Yep. It's going to um, be great. Well, anyway, I think we kind of covered everything other than, you know, your, your personal, uh, your, every one of your personal hunting trips, you, you, you went, as far, <laughs> went as far as Montana, you went as far south as Iowa. Yep. Are, are you, I get the invites and you, and you just mentioned that Maryland was going to go down and chase Merns quail. I've resisted that. I don't know why. Maybe it's just to travel. Have you been down for the 
Mex or the Arizona. I mean, that's about where everybody goes, but have you, you know, been? I have not. And sometimes I was just talking with my, you know, you know, Jared Harbart, don't you? He's got a, I think he's got a wire haired Vishla as well. Yeah. I know he's talked, talked to you before, but he's uh, I think on his way down there right now, but he just asked me, he's like, why aren't you down here for a couple of weeks? And part of me says, I don't know because my parents live in Tucson, got a wonderful joint that I could oh. just, yeah, honestly, I, I could go down there and, and, uh, raise hell with, with in Burns <laughs> country. And I'd like to try it sometime. Um, quail as a bird themselves, like I've hunted Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, Texas, um, so that's, that's been good. I start, sorry, we're on the, we're staying in Texas, not in Oklahoma. So just Oklahoma, uh, and Kansas and Nebraska and Iowa, uh, you know, for, for Bob white quail, but they don't necessarily have the allure to me as a pheasant does. And maybe that's because I've got pheasants right in my backyard. Right, and just right. the, the species in general. I just, that's what I've been chasing. Um, then the other part of this too, is like, you've only got so much time to chase upland birds and all the other things. So I'm actually getting ready to apply here for um, an archery elk permit and a general unit in Wyoming for 2023. Wow. Um, you know, and that's uh that's going to be a eight to 10 day hunt that, you know, takes up, takes up a lot of time. And the other side of it too, is a little thing called pheasant fest. It's just hard. Oh, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes hard for me to leave the office in, in, in January. Um, but we are going down. We're going down to Tucson, Arizona, uh, for about two weeks um, after Pheasant Fest at the beginning of March, and I think the season's closed by then. But there's, uh, you know, there's over-the-counter javelina with a bow and other things that uh, <laughs> might kind of, kind of get me going a little bit too. So yeah, no, yeah. I just haven't uh, haven't taken the time to plan that trip out yet. But one of these years, I keep telling my buddies, let's go stay with my parents and. Yeah. You know, when we're not hanging out at the the pool or maybe hitting yeah. the golf course a little bit, we'll bring the dogs and go chase some some desert quail and, and up in Mern's country too. Yeah, I I might be talked into if I had the place, you know. But I, I it's funny too. I kind of the same way about I I cut my teeth on pheasants in Illinois, yep. and and could find them here in Illinois before I figured or in Michigan because we still had a pretty decent population thirty years ago, yep. and then started traveling to the Dakotas. It's just always been like other people like, oh, no, I like cubby birds. I'm like, when you outsmart one or your dog outsmarts one cock bird, you know, I'm not mean the one that just sat there and he just was born, you know, 18 or 28 weeks ago. When you get one of them, <laughs> to me, that's like, getting yeah, a, that's like getting a deer, you know? Yep. You're, they you're are, playing, you're playing a chessboard game with them in grasslands. They, and, don't, play, they don't play by the rules. <laughs> I sometimes, no, they definitely do not. And I sometimes wonder too, what's the proportion of like, are there more, and I don't know this, I'm asking, and maybe you have a better sense of it. Are there more quail hunters that come up to hunt pheasant once or twice a year just to get that taste? Or are there more pheasant hunters that go south to hunt to hunt quail because yeah. i know like you know that the tyler webster's and my buddy jared and, and those guys of the world um I, i've heard it's pretty busy down in Merns country this year i know a lot of right. pheasant hunters who have traveled uh yeah. traveled south and i know some guys out of montana that we were hunting with a few weeks ago too they actually go um they, they go down south too for about a month um you know and and hunt them as well so i, I don't know the answer to that maybe you yeah have a better, i don't either i don't either but hold on I, I have the affinity for, you know, the upper Midwest. I guess I really do. And I've never, there is no board anywhere in this kennel room that says birds I have to go hunt yet. You know, yep. I, it, yep. for me, it's it's uh, people I haven't met yet, dogs I haven't met yet. And if the the place could be the place, but it's usually, it's usually in pheasant country. <laughs> I I do know though that the people that go go down to the to the southwest to to hunt you know desert quail species and whatnot, yeah. um, they fall in love with it pretty quick. They and do. I I see a bunch of them when I go down to my parents' house. There's about eighty of them that roost in the tree in their backyard. You know, every <laughs> night it's just fun. It's fun to watch them. Um, yeah. But I just I haven't taken the dive yet to bring bring the bring the dogs down there during the season. Maybe. Maybe perhaps you said you don't have a place to stay. I, I think I know of somebody that has maybe, one. Maybe so in a year or two if you're ever Maybe down. you and I can go down there. Yeah, we, we we can have some fun. We can have some fun. Yeah, that'd be great. Right. But so, uh, Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I said speaking of fun, this has been a hoot. It's been a hoot. It's like yeah. having a little, uh, it's like having a tailgate chat before we 
put some ammo in our pouch. Yeah, yeah no, I appreciate you having me on. For anybody that's listening, I'll just give a quick quick recap of National Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic. Um, it's basically running uh, February 17th through the 19th. Um, it starts off with, we've actually got a film fest on Thursday night, the 16th, which tickets are for sale right now at pheasantsforever.org or quail, or sorry, pheasantfest.org. Um, you can purchase those on there. I believe they're going to go really fast. Uh, we've got a quail hunt, a timber doodle hunt, uh, uh, Capricale over in Europe. We've got a Project Upland hunt for that as well, um, and a pheasant hunt that we're showing, sh showing short films and getting together with a lot of bird hunters at the Poor House in downtown Minneapolis. So that'll be fun. Friday, Bird Dog Parade starts at 11 a.m. Pheasant Fest opens at noon. Uh, we're open throughout the weekend. Everything from shotguns and bird dogs to, you know, quality gear, finding if you never hunted before. It's a great way to meet new people and, and get into upland hunting and the outdoors in general. Um, bird dog trauma training. There's all sorts of things going on. And there's a wait list right now. If you want to go to the banquets, there's a wait list you can sign up for, and we're going to be sifting through that pretty quick here. But uh, we got I think we got some big crowds coming because we've got sold out 1,500 person banquets right now. And yeah. just really looking forward to it. It's going to be a fun event and can't wait to hang out with you in the booth a little bit. Throw some cornhole. Yeah. Yeah. I want yeah. a little, uh, I think, I think I was given a green light to have cornhole for conservation. We're going to take a yeah, I like that. food crate. We're going to bring the bean bags. In fact, I'm going to order some. My buddy last night was we we built a bar, <clears throat> so I've got I'm gonna have a photo of the what's behind me. It's gonna be the backdrop, and we built a temporary bar to simulate my high top table. So it's gonna be you know the it's gonna be the Hunting Dog Podcast uh, Saloon this year, and we'll have a cornhole game, and people people can throw a buck in a pot, take a shot, and if they can get the beanbag and if they think they're good. Uh, we'll let them stand there all day and spend their money and we'll get that money back to some habitat projects. Goodwill, good, goodwill donations, goodwill, goodwill donations. Yep. You can play it for free, but I think you should throw a dollar in for the birds. Yeah. Oh, we got all sorts of cool little fundraising things going on in the floor that are coming back to build a wildlife area. Um, our signature acquisition program for pheasants forever to get one more new area and provide yeah. uh, places for bird dogs to roam. Uh, ben Ben just told me from Onyx they're going to be part of that Friday night. Uh, what what's that going to be called? They're going they to are. They've got. Uh, they were still working on the name for it, but uh, Friday okay. night after the Upland Rally, uh, they're basically hosting a social afterwards. Yeah. Um, where for for every I think it's for every beer, um, beer purchased, um, they're giving five dollars back to I believe it's Build a Wildlife Area. So yeah, yeah, we we're looking forward to that as well. Anybody who doesn't have time to run into me at the booth will find me there on Friday night. I guarantee it. Yep, I'll be there as well. <laughs> All right. Come I'll introduce see yourselves. <laughs> it's uh, see, it's the 16th. It's Monday. So I'm gonna see you in I'm gonna see you in uh, 30 days. Sounds good. Appreciate you having us on. Thanks, Jared. We'll see you. Take care.